stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Holy is the Lord. assistant. <laughs> what is my assistant holding? <laughs> Wrong again. This is a gospel opportunity. How many people would like to be a missionary but can't do it for whatever reason? You can. Pack a shoebox. This is not only a gift that's going to go to a child in another country that never is going to ever see another present or gift again. But the gospel is presented to them with this box, and they get to hear about Jesus Christ. And that's just totally awesome. So we have a special message for all of you from Ghana. Um, I'm a pastor in a church in Ghana, and then we receive these two boxes from you guys here. And you guys may not know the kind of amazing work that these boxes are doing in our kids in Ghana. We go to the remotest part in Ghana to do distribution and then also organize training for pastors, for para ministries and for other NGOs who want to come on board. And the, most of the time, we've come up with various testimonies that will blow your mind. 
I'll share one or two of them with you because you see the boxes as tiny as they are. You may think it's nothing. You may think, oh, let's put in some school supplies, let's put in some few items into it. But listen to me, boy, this is an awesome testimony. This is an awesome thing that God is using these boxes to do. Uh, we, did a, we did a distribution in, the, in an orphanage in Ghana. And listen, uh, there was this small boy in that orphanage of just about eight to nine years old. Everybody referred to this boy as pastor. Whatever they do, they want this boy to come and pray for them. And then, amongst all the kids in that orphanage, uh, we gave everybody the box. He was the only person who had a Bible in his box. And not just a New Testament, but it said it was a steady Bible. You can't imagine. Nobody in that orphanage, in that home, had a Bible in their box, except this small boy. It's awesome. Listen to this one. This one will blow your mind. Now, there was this girl in the school who had been sacked from school for non-payment of school fees. Uh, so the day she had us come there to do distribution, she decided to come to school that very day. And then uh, we gave them the boxes. Unfortunately, or fortunately, she had the tiniest box. And whilst her friend had, you know, received the big boxes, she sat down and started crying. So I went there and said, baby, why are you crying? He said, my box is too small. Can you please change it and give me one of the big ones? I said, you take this one, open it. He said, I won't open it. I don't like it. Give me a big one. I insisted and told her, I prevailed over her and said, that open it. And she opened the box. Uh, lo and behold, she had $200 in the box. And amazingly, you guys are not supposed to put money in a box. So the question is that how come that box alone had $200? So now I told her that, okay, I'm ready to change it for you. So give me and then get a, a bigger one. She said, I won't give it to you. You know, so these are amazing stories. Uh, and then this one is about a small boy whose father was a carpenter. Now, I don't know how carpentry tools find its way into the box, because I know you put school supplies, candies, and stuff like that. But this particular box had um, carpentry tools. Now, the father was a carpenter who was out of business because he doesn't have carpentry tools any longer. And they live in a deprived community. So this boy received the box, took it home, opened the box, and lo and behold, carpentry tools. The father came around and said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I thank you. I thank you. And listen to me. It is not about us. You guys are doing an awesome job. And the boxes you're giving us is meeting major needs. We thank you so much. And we know that as you continue to do that, God will also meet your, your needs. We know you also have certain needs. As we continue to pray for you and continue to partner with you, we know that God is going to take you up higher, open major doors and open major needs for you, and then bring the desires of your heart to come to pass. God bless you so much. It's good seeing all of you guys around. And I hope one of these days, some of you will come to visit us in Ghana to go along with us for our distribution. God bless you. Enjoy your day. Shalom. What do you think of this, huh? It's cool to see all these folks who are dedicated to our young people. They pray for them. They study for them. They live the life before them. And I think this is awesome. Uh, Awana starts. Where's Joyce here? Starts Friday. What time? 6.30. Grades what? To age, ages and grades what? Uh, age 3 years old to 6th grade. Age 3 to 6th grade. Uh, one, and then Sunday school is in the middle of it all. <clears throat> From little kids all the way up through adults. But we appreciate all of you and your uh, faithful service to the Lord. It's our privilege as elders to pray for you. Uh, this is a big responsibility. And it's not just a Sunday responsibility. It's a life responsibility. Uh, you live the life before them, the kids read that, and they say, I want to be like my Sunday school teacher or a WANA leader. So it's a big deal, and we uh, appreciate it. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for each one of these people who are so concerned for young people as to give their time and energy and thought to help lead them. We pray, Lord, that you would go before them, that you would bind Satan away from this facility so that they can focus we pray that there would be honest questions. We pray that the Bible would be spoken and lived. We pray that they would be wise with the answers that they give the children and that they would be um, examples of how to live a life before them. 
We pray that you do a great work, Lord, not only in our own children, but the children that will come who don't know the Lord yet. We pray that this be an awesome year for you and for your impact. In Christ's name, amen. to continue in a time of worship just in that same spirit if you would stand with us we serve a great God who paid the ultimate price so that we could be free and that freedom is something that cannot be taken away from you so we're going to worship him this morning
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then be in him found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For this stand before the throne. my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you what I uh, need before we start this morning is uh, two volunteers <laughs> why do you laugh I don't understand that <clears throat> who would like to volunteer Oh, that's danger. I, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I didn't say sit down. I didn't. Okay, come on up. And, and your name is? Elias. <laughs> and your name, sir? I'm also Elias. <laughs> One of you is lying. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, <clears throat> these guys don't know this, what they're going to do, um, <clears throat> but they're going to talk. And... Um, they're both going to sit in a chair, but we're going to talk like this. Okay, go ahead and sit down. You guys can't look at each other, <clears throat> but go ahead and talk. And we won't listen to what they're going to say. So, uh, that was good. Got the extra hour of sleep for this one. Yeah. Yeah, pretty excited about that. Okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> from the rest of your participants, um, what is, uh, what, what's the good and bad of this particular style of talking to each other? No eye contact. No eye contact. But they really have to listen to each other. They certainly have to listen to each other when you're back to back like this. What else? Can't see any body language, how you're responding. All you can hear is tone of voice. Do you guys like to talk like this when you're talking with people? Okay, that's good. You can stand up, guys. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk like this. Go ahead. 
can't look at each other. <laughs> okay, guys, go ahead. So, Elias, how was your morning? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I've heard this conversation before. I think you know. Um, what's the? How is this kind of conversation doing? What, what's the advantage disadvantage of this? Side by side. Go ahead. There's no eye contact still. What else? It's a little easier to hear, but not great still. It's kind of like riding in a car, isn't it? You know, when you're riding in a car? Um, <clears throat> do you like to have conversations like this? It's better than back to back. So, okay, get up, guys. <laughs> Let's see if we can improve our conversation. <clears throat> okay, so uh, go ahead, sit down. This conversation is supposed to improve this way. <laughs> David, how was your morning? Elias, my morning was wonderful. <laughs> okay. I should have qualified you. I asked to come up, you know. Um, what's, how's this kind of conversation? I mean, what's the difference? What's, what's the advantages here? They're face to face. There is eye contact. You can see what's going on with the other person. It's more meaningful, possibly if the conversation picked up a little bit, but. <laughs> more personal contact. More personal contact, yes. Okay, guys, thank you uh, for your excellent uh, behaviors. <laughs> okay, we're gonna come to why this is important. Okay, take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Exodus. Chapter 4. What we're going to talk about is the word Adonai. And how it is spelled in your Bible, specifically in the Old Testament, it is a capital L. It means the Lord. It's capital L with small letters after that. O, R, and D are small letters. Go ahead and uh, switch the slide there. Remember before Jehovah was spelled, L-O-R-D was all capital letters? That was the word Jehovah, or Yahweh. And that was written, uh, but it was not spoken. And they would use the word Adonai instead. The word Adonai is used 215 times in the Bible for people. And it is always in the singular form. It means master. But when it is used of God, it is always, almost always plural. It's interesting because God speaks of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I have uh, six major points regarding this whole concept of Adonai. Uh, for me, this is a, a new study for me. I'm, I'm learning as I'm going, so you're hearing what I'm learning uh, as well. And I'm really encouraged with this because it is showing God in a fresh way for me on how he is um, a wonderful God, but he's very personal. And this particular name of God, Adonai, is very personal. And I want you to catch that as we go here. The number one point is this. The Lord, the word the Lord, signifies ownership or mastership. The truth is that God is the owner of all of us. And he demands obedience. We have in Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, Lord of Lords, it could be termed Master of Masters. The second concept is this. The Lord is willingly hears our heart cry of inadequacy. And why was that Exodus 4? As I wanted you to read, this was... Uh, Moses is in the uh, 
Old Testament. Remember in chapter 3, he had just seen the burning bush, and he tells Moses, I've heard the cry of my people down in Egypt, and I am concerned for them, and I'm sending you to go get them. <laughs> Moses uh, responds to that like, uh, who me? <laughs> Why should I go? And so in chapter 4, I'm going to start with verse 10. I want you to listen He's starting to have interactions with God about why he doesn't think he should go because he's inadequate for the task. And it is the Lord that he addresses. He talks about um, what, what if they don't pay attention to me and all that kind of thing. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, Oh Lord, notice how it changes there from Lord Jehovah or Yahweh to O oh Lord Adonai. It's the spoken word here. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and, and tongue. Most scholars will say that Moses had a speech impediment and he st st stuttered. And he couldn't talk well. And here he was to lead this great nation. He would stand up to talk and he would st stutter. You ever listen to anyone like that who uh, struggles? And it's painful to watch. And yet I've seen other people who stutter sing, and they sing like an angel. It's just an interesting uh, way the body works with that. But Moses couldn't speak well. He was not clear. And he said, listen, uh, Lord, <laughs> um, this is me, this is Moses. Hey, I'm down here. I, I don't speak very well. So how am I going to lead a nation of three and a half million people anywhere when I'm just not eloquent in speech, and people want to follow a, a brilliant leader. I'm not the guy really for the task. So that's, that's where he's at. You ever feel like that when God says, I want you to go do something? You give him a list of reasons why you can't do that? Here's Moses. Verse 11, the Lord, this is Jehovah, said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So he's saying, listen, now all these things that you call weaknesses or deficiencies, who gave them to you? And he says, I did. God did. Verse 12, now go, and I will help you speak, and will teach you what to say. So what he does is he, had, he doesn't skirt the issue of Moses with his speech issue, he says, listen, I know I gave you that mouth. I gave you the inability to be clear. And I will teach you what to say. And I will go with you. So he doesn't skirt the issue at all. I will help you speak. Verse 13, Moses said, thank you, Lord. No, he didn't. He says this. Oh, Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> you ever feel like that sometimes when you have a task put on you and you think, oh, I'm the wrong guy for that or I'm the wrong gal for that, or you're in high school and, and you're supposed to go do this thing and give a speech or something, you think, why should I do that? I, I'm just not the right person for the job. And God says, I will speak for you, through you. So this is after a whole series of five issues that Moses chirped out. This is the last one that we see. Basically, he's unwilling to go because he's afraid of how people are going to view him. Verse 14, the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and, uh, to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you to speak and will teach what you are to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth as if you were God to him. So what God did was, is he sat down, and, and I kind of feel it's almost like this, is he sat down with Moses in a chair and talked to him like this. Moses was, well, felt very comfortable talking to God. It's almost like his friend was sitting right there and he says, oh, Lord, I'm just not, I'm not good for the task. I, you know I can't speak well. I can't do this thing. Forget nothing about all the miracles that he had to do. He said, I can't talk. 
He said, send somebody else. Even though the Lord was listening to him and he said, I'll, I'll speak through you and I'll help you out. He says, Aaron's coming as his brother. He said, he can speak well. Now, what, isn't it curious that God didn't choose his brother? He chose Moses. Now, why did he do that? Because he knew the heart of Moses. He says, you've been concerned for these people. And I'm choosing you to be my representative, not Aaron, your brother, who can speak well. I'm going to choose someone who has some inadequacies. And I, because then you can't claim credit yourself. And so you will be like God to Aaron. And Aaron will speak for you. But I will whisper through you to Aaron. Why didn't he just cut Moses out of the whole picture? Why didn't he just go through it to Aaron? He didn't do it that way. He chose a person who's inadequate to do a great thing. And my friends, God wants to choose an inadequate person like you too. Whatever your weakness or whatever your flaw is, he wants to choose you to do something very significant for the kingdom. If I was to take a mic here and it was just you and me, there'd be all sorts of things people would have in this room about why God can't use them. All sorts of reasons why. And God says, you know what? I'm Adonai. I'm your, I'm your Lord. You can be honest to me. I will address the need that you feel you have. And I'll equip you to do it. Just like a friend to friend. Let's continue on here because it's really interesting. You go to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 18 to 27. And uh, David is... Uh, having a prayer there and he's talking to God and, and uh, David was to become king and, and he's saying who am I that you have blessed my future in me and he's looking at his own life and David was uh, the youngest of his family and, and uh, he said God why did you choose me and this is actually a question I have of the Lord myself is why did you choose me you know and God says this I have been with you wherever you have gone and then David had courage to pray to God. And so God chose David, who was just a little boy, to slay Goliath. Remember he slayed Goliath? And when all his brothers, his big macho football-type brothers, couldn't do it, they were scared. David went right out there as a little teenager and slayed the giant because he knew God was with him. And God refreshes this in, in that passage. He says, I have been with you, David, wherever you have gone. And it's a phenomenal concept. Earlier there, um, this third point says this, the Lord addresses our concerns and gives us confidence. That's what he does. You guys identify with that slide? You know, you take that robe off and he's just a mild-mannered, muscleless little kid, but you put that cape on and all of a sudden he's leaping off couches and flying and he thinks and Somehow I can picture some of you doing that, actually. <laughs> David found courage to pray, and God was a safe place for him. When I, when I was going through my Bible in earlier years, I would keep track of anyone who said that God was with him. And I'd write it in the back of my Bible under with, you know, under that. And uh, I kept writing every time I saw it, because it, it says very often that God was with him, or people would look at them and they would say, God is with you. They told it of Joseph and Isaac and Jeremiah and David and um, Moses and all these different people. They said, God is with you. I found 30 characters in the Bible that said that either they said that God is with me or people said about them that God is with them. And I said, God, when I get older, as I grow up, I want people to say of me, God is with you. That's an honor. God is with you. What you say and what you do and what you think is God is with you. He's speaking through you. He's talking to you. He's giving you insight. He's giving you wisdom. It doesn't matter what the world thinks because God is with you. So I tell you that because some of you are thinking you're doing this life on your own. And it's not true. You can't really do it well on your own. You need God with you. 
So he addressed Gideon. Gideon came and uh, there was people who came in and would, would uh, take over the countryside and steal all the food and produce and sheep and everything else. They'd take everything. And Gideon was hiding in a uh, wine press because he was thrashing wheat. Normally they go thrash wheat up on the top of the hills where the wind can blow, but he was in a wine press because he didn't want the enemy to find him. The Midianites. And the angel came and said, Oh, mighty warrior. And he kind of did one of these, looked around like, Who, me, you know. And he gives an illustration in Judges 16, 14 through 16. He says, How can I save? He saw him himself as least of all in his side of the family. He said, I'm the least of them. And he, Jehovah said, go, and I will be with you. God was with him, and that was good enough. He didn't need more skill. He just needed to be willing to go with God. Point number four, the Lord calls and commissions us to his service. He has a point for this whole thing. Why? Because he has a mission that he wants to accomplish through us. Every one of us has a mission that God wants to accomplish. Through us. It's called purpose. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet. In Isaiah 6, verse 5 through 8, Isaiah was speaking to the Lord, actually. He says, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Verse 6, and one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which had been taken with the tongs of the altar. With it, it touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. You see, he was concerned because he was a man of unclean lips. And so he was able to sit and talk with God. He said, here's my mouth. That's okay. Symbolically, I'll take a live colon, I'll touch your lips, and now you're okay. Your guilt's taken away. Verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord. This is Adonai saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. See, he was willing because God met him where his need was. And God commissioned him to go. He says, I'll go. That doesn't say what success. You read on verse 9 through 10, 11. Doesn't sound like it's going to be great success for Isaiah. But God was with him. Didn't really matter more than that. Go to Jeremiah, the very next book. Jeremiah was a teenager here. And God had his hand on his life. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because of his concern for Israel and its condition. Here's what it says, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This is while he was still in his mother's womb. God said, I knew you there. And I, gave you, I appointed you before you even knew me. I knew you. And I set you... I love this section because before he was born, God says, I knew you and I appointed you to do a task. To be a prophet among the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. A child that lacks confidence. A child that lacks understanding. 
I'm only a child. So that was his concern. Verse 7, but the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. Watch what he says. For I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah was, it was, he had a tough road. He was uh, thrown in uh, a cistern and left to die. He was part of the group that left Israel um, under duress. God says, you go. I will rescue you. See, we don't know all the answers of when God says we want, he wants to use us. We don't know all of them. But we can sit down with him and say, here's my insecurities. Here's where I'm at. And very often he'll say, I will deal with that. Now you go. But he, the point that I really like is he listens. He listens to us. He doesn't blow us off. He has time for us to talk to him. And he cares. Paul wrote, turn, turn with me to um, 1 Timothy 12. First Timothy 1, verse 12. Here's Paul. We know him as Paul, as this great discipler, this great evangelist, this great debater. But Paul before this was a tough boy from the other side of the tracks who hated Christians, who murdered people, who drugged them off to prison. He was a tough guy. Verse 12, 1 Timothy 1. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, Adonai, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. So he's thanking God that he said, here's your, here's your purpose. I'm heading you in a direction. Verse 13, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured upon me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for this very, very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example of those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, immortal, invisible, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Paul had a really, now in Paul's case, he was a zealot, but he had a bad past. And when he was breaking into this Christianity thing, people didn't trust him because of his past. They said, he's going to trick us. And then when he gets uh, where, where he knows where we are, he's going to drag us to prison. And it took Barnabas and others wisdom to go in and say, you know what? Our brother does have a past, but he's a changed man. God has changed him. How many of us, if we had the chance to say, you know, oh, we got a bad past bad stuff. We made bad choices or bad stuff happened to us. God can't use us. Look at Paul. Paul says, my stuff will top yours any day. I was the chief of sinners, not just a bad guy. I was the, I was the worst of the worst. And God saved me and appointed me to a task for the kingdom. As an example to you, don't give up. It was the Lord that did that for him. Adonai. And then finally, if you go into Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel addresses the Lord. Ten times in 17 verses, it uses that word, Adonai. Humbling, addressing the Lord in prayer and forgiveness for his people. This word, Lord, is really a wonderful piece because he... He addresses our concerns, he meets those needs, and he still sends us off. 
He doesn't say, well, yeah, you really got a lot of problems. I can see how I can't use you. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He gets focused, and like in Jeremiah's case, before he was even born, before he had a chance to do anything, he said, Jeremiah, by the way, you're going to be a prophet. People aren't going to like you, but I'm going to send you anyway. Number five, the Lord is the ultimate servant example. You go into the New Testament now, and it talks about the Lord. The Lord uses himself. He calls himself the Lord. In the Old Testament, it's Adonai. In the New Testament, it's called Curious. It's a Greek word now. But he uses it about himself, and he emphasized the concept of him being a servant. And he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. In Philippians 2, he was obedient to death. In other words, being a servant, he was obedient, and it cost him his life. He was on mission. And number six, the Lord expects faithful service of us. Some of you have worked a long and hard road, many years for the Lord. Some of you are just starting out. You're saying, ooh, this is harder than I expected. Some of you may be in a path where you say, where is God in this? Well, God's still there. He's with you, just like he was with every one of these others, wanting you to do the task in spite of your weaknesses. And in fact, many times he'll use your weaknesses and he will fill the gap so that you don't take the credit. He speaks or works or acts or thinks through you. It's pretty awesome. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Serve God 150%. It will never be put to waste. And you say, well, pastor, I don't see any results or the results are minimal. It really doesn't matter what you see. It's what God sees because God sees in secret and he sees the intentions and the attitudes of your heart. He says, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Don't give up. 1 Corinthians 6, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You see, the body that you and I have is not our body. Isn't that interesting? We feed it. We take care of it. We bathe it. We dress it. We nurture it. We think about our body a lot. And he says... <laughs> Hello? It's not your body. Just like in marriage, the wife's body is not hers, it's her husband's. And the husband's body is not his, it's hers. And so you take care of that body out of respect for the other person. But in Christian circles, this body is not yours as a Christian. You gave that up when you became a Christian. You died when he died. And now you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Romans 12, 1 talks about bringing your body and giving it as a living sacrifice. Daily giving it to God. Interesting. Ephesians 5, 17, we are to, as a servant, we are to know the Lord's will. And that word Lord's will, by the way, is Adonai. It's this personal God who will sit and talk with us. And hear us. We're to know the will of God for our life. We've been, the Lord gives us gifts, Ephesians 4. He encourages it in hard times. 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. It's written of Paul was in prison. And he says this. Verse 16. This is the last book written by Paul, and it was his heart. At, first, at my first defense, no one came to support me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them, but the Lord, Adonai, stood by my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, 
and all the Gentiles might hear it. That was the mission that God had given him. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his kingdom. To him be glory forever. Shortly after that, Paul was beheaded. But he says, the Lord will bring me safely home. Isn't that an interesting concept? He was still concerned at the end of his life for his mission. He knew his mission was to reach Gentiles, and he was focused on that even on his days before he died, that the world might know. Are you at that point where you're so focused, regardless of what's going on, you're focused on the mission that God has given you? The Lord will stand with you even in your hard times. He requires that we be found faithful. In Matthew 25, it is the word Lord, Adonai, that gives the task about being faithful as a servant. And he rewards or not re punishes those who are faithful in his service. It's that Lord who does that. The same Lord that sat down and talked with you about your mission. At the end, he, he wanted to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. <clears throat> do you want to be found well at the end? Do you want to finish well? I do. It is the Lord who wants you to. And that means a life. It doesn't mean you just <laughs> live life the way you want to and then at the end you say, oh yeah, let me finish well. It means that you make choices on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a month basis, on a year basis, on a decade basis. Well for God. And I am proud of so many of you, the way you're making choices. Mr. Benson, can you come up for a minute? We had a team that just went to Canada. And, I'll, yeah, I'll just let Len explain. They just went up Friday and came back Saturday here. So what happened? Well, we went to Canada. Uh, the verse uh, that they presented uh, on one of the points, God said, whom shall we send will go for us. And uh, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And you have, we have a number of people in this church that have responded to that very call from God. And we do go out and do mission work. We went up to Dunham, uh, Quebec this weekend. We go there a couple of times a year. We left 6 o'clock Friday morning. We got back at uh, 7 o'clock last night. Had two good solid days of work. But the team who went up uh, with, with us, stand up, please, so the folks in the church can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> But that wasn't for applause or recognition, but I want you to know that those folks uh, uh, do believe in the call to go out and do mission work. And the, the missionary that was up there, Pastor Ock, I mean, the enthusiasm and the excitement uh, of that, I wish I had half of what he has when he was talking about those Christmas boxes, as far as mission work is concerned. But, but I do, uh, and, and we all feel it when we go. And we have a number of opportunities in the church to go do mission work. And, and I hope you all know about that. And anybody can go. This is adult mission trips, so we take adults. And, uh, um, and we go to different places. And to go out and serve, uh, the comments we get from those we go see is, you have blessed us richly and deeply. And thank you, and thank you, and thank you. But it's really the other, other way around. Ask any of those who have gone. The blessing is to us to get that, go out and serve other of our time, talent, treasures, those things, Scott talked about earlier as far as giving is concerned. So it all ties it together with, with giving and with service and with mission work. And, and our church does it. And when we're up there, we're identified as, as the Calvary Bible Church from Vermont. And we are a work team. There's no other teams up there. There was 100 people up there this yesterday working. And they were couples and two, three guys and men coming to do things and stuff like that. We're the only ones that go out there with a the team. Uh, they had, they want us to change 11 windows in this three-story building, and it was the dormers, the top windows up at the top. I got that right? 11, not 9, right? It was 11? I kept saying 9 whole trip, but it was 11. Had to take the old windows out that didn't open. There was cracks in the glass. There was cracks around the windows. Bats actually flew into children's bedrooms through the windows, and, uh, and they leaked in the winter, and they couldn't open them in the summer. The only problem we had was the windows they got for us were five inches shorter than the frames that they went into. <laughs> they were the exact width, so 
uh, we had talent and skill with us that were able to build those window boxes and those frames in and make it look uh, better than new. Beautiful job, all trimmed out, all the windows done. They thought we'd get maybe half of them done. So we made a big difference up at a YWAM uh, mission base up in Dunham, Quebec this weekend. I want to encourage you uh, to be thinking about those things, how you can go out and serve. It's really kind of effortless. It just takes a little bit of your time and it makes so much difference in the lives of people who are out there on the tip of the spear. Thank you. Wait, wait. So where are we going next? <laughs> Y'all probably won't want to go. No, probably now, not. So I, we haven't uh, advertised it yet, but we're going to talk about it some. We're going to Hawaii in February. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, God didn't say you had to go here or you had to go there. He just said go where the needs are. So the beautiful thing. But it's in Hawaii in February. In, Hawaii. <laughs> in February. So the needs are everywhere, and the beauty of working with YWAM and mission builders, and you've heard the Briggs speak up here uh, last week or the week before. They're the ones who kind of organize all this. Uh, there's some real serious work needs to be done out there, so what the heck, we might as well go. <laughs> okay. So it's going to be a great trip, and uh, we'll be able to take along a number of people, so be thinking about it. We'll publicize it, and we'll get a sign-up sheet out soon. Okay, let's stand. Are you her favorite?